Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 32nd meetup and the first of a very special season. My name is Salome and I research and teach data visualization and infographics at the Lisbon School of Architecture. We, as you know, are part of DataViz Lisboa and we are a group of professionals and enthusiasts who love transforming information into meaningful charts and graphs. Since 2019, we bring together specialists from all over the world to share their practices and expertise. Hello, everyone. My name is Renata. I'm an information designer and partner of a visual storytelling studio called Labuta. Uh, this meetup is a very special one and is the first of our Latin American fashion season. We will invite those who are changing Latin American visualization as a way to bring a different perspective and give visibility to data visualization produced outside the global north. And today we have a very special guest also. Uh, we have Barbara Emanuel. She is a designer, teacher, and PhD with a focus on rhetoric in design. Decisions we make while creating visualizations influence communication, even when we are not aware of it. Let's talk about rhetorics in information design and how visual elements can be persu persuaded. This, uh, this session ends with a Q&A, so prepare your questions along uh, Barbara's talk and pose them whenever you want. So welcome, Barbara. Thanks for being here with us today. And the stage is, is yours. Thank you, Salome. Thank you, Renata. Hello, everyone. Um, if you can put my presentation on, I think we can start. So hello everyone, I'm Barbara. As they said, I'm from Brazil. So I think we can start from there. It's something that is um, very important in my work and for me to be Brazilian. We have some specific uh, situations that make us um, go through different hardships. And well, right now we're, as, in, as everybody else, we're in the middle of a crisis and we have something uh, that makes it even harder that we have the, probably the stupid, this, the most stupid person in the world <laughs> governing us right now. It's our idiot in chief. So we have to do with little resources. So we have to overcome a lot of things. So that makes us uh, a very creative people because we don't have a lot of resources to work with. And I think that's something important also to think about Brazil as being a colonized country. We come from European colonization as uh, most of all Amer Latin America. So that's also part of our work and the way we see things that right now we're starting to look at things and realize what's really ours and what comes from a perspective, a point of view that's not ours, that com comes from another culture, another country. And that's also something to do with information design, the way we see things. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a teacher and a researcher and a designer. Uh, but I didn't know what was I was going to be when I was in school. So I, I knew I wanted to study communication and I was also interested in design. But I didn't know what to do. So I applied for both schools and I had that very nice problem of being accepted in both schools. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? And um, luckily my father was an astrologist so he looked into my um, birth chart and he said I had a triangle of communication. So I said, okay, let's go to communication school. And so I, I went there and my major was advertising. So from early on, I, I learned that everything is communication. Uh, the way we speak, the way we dress, the movements we make, they were all communicating something. 
And more than that, that communication is never neutral. I enter uh, the wonderful world of, um, sorry, <laughs> the wonderful world of rhetoric. So I learned that everything is rhetorical. Uh, what do I mean by that? That if I talk to you like, good morning, there's something there uh, that will make you want to reply, that you make you want to ignore me. Uh, we are, we're always trying to convince someone of something, even if it's just like, believe what I'm saying, or keep on listening to what I'm saying. There's always rhetoric there, even if it's not to convince someone of doing something, of believing something. There's always rhetoric some, somewhere, somehow. So when I finished, uh, I graduated from communication school. I still had that design itch that I wanted to learn more about design. So I took another exam um, and I entered the design school finally. So I was a little older and after four years of communication school and I had all this experience of uh, com persuasive communication in advertising. But one of the first things I've heard in design school uh, from the professors was that information design is neutral. If there's any persuasion, then it is not design, it's advertising. And they say that, that like advertising is the worst thing that something could be. You know? And when I heard that, I was like, what? Is, that, is it even possible? Like, I, I want to learn more about it. So I was in a school that was heavily influenced by modernism and Bauhaus and Ulm. It was in Brazil, but very German in a way. So, okay, let me read the classics and try to understand more about this point of view. And what I learned in the end is like, no, it's wrong. It's, it's impossible. It's not neutral. It's an intention of neutrality that's very modernist, modernist but it's not neutral. It's if you want to appear neutral, it's already a rhetorical resource, a device, an intention. So I said, okay, I want to learn more about it. I want to write about it in my graduation project. And they said, uh, no, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. So okay, uh, I don't, I don't mind. I'm gonna do something really modern. I did a, I designed a system of pictograms. That was, and I went to Germany in exchange semester, so it was as Germany could be, as modernist as it could be at the time. And I thought, okay, but then I'm gonna have my masters, and it will be all about proving you wrong. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a revenge uh, thesis. I said I want to prove them wrong and show them that there's always some something rhetorical in graphic design. So I, I wrote this book, it's my master thesis. I did it uh, in Germany and it was really nice for me to see that the idea I had of uh, German design schools that I learned from a Brazilian point of view and it was not uh, what it is today. So I went to a school that was really accepted, uh, accepting of this idea and so I wrote about areas that I had heard before that they were neutral. So information design, visualization, um, news design, typography, and cartography. So I, I analyzed examples and I studied how, about how it's not possible to be neutral there and how rhetorical they are. And that was over 10 years ago, I think, yeah. And recently I wrote a version in Portuguese, finally, my mother language. And so if you want to read it, they're both in different websites around, but you can find them in my website, visualizando.com. Or just write it in Google and my name and I'm, it's not hard to find. So I was trying to prove how, how rhetorical these areas can be, and it's something that is so alive in our our day-to-day -day communication. Like this is a 
first page, front page from O Globo. It's, if it's not the largest, it's one of the largest newspapers in, in Brazil. And you can see that there's a headline that's easily identifiable as a headline because it's on top, is uh, the largest uh, type, is um, bold. So you know it's the main thing. And you have uh, one large photograph. So you can think, okay, this is the main thing as well. And they are placed next to each other. So I think they are related. You know, this is a uh, gestalt. So the headline says um, that there's a criminal organization in one of the main political parties, the, the one on the left, uh, PT. And there's a photograph full of boxes and suitcases full of money. So if you look at it, you think, yeah, they're definitely criminals. They stole all this money and they hid it in suitcases. What thugs? And, but this photograph is actually from this other small story on the right that's about another political party on the right. And the guy from that party had stolen all this money. But the news design was created there to make you think the photograph and the headline are related. And this is something that happens all the time, at least here in Brazil. So how can you say that this is not rhetorical when we, we use visualization as an argument like this, this is very strong because it's direct visualization of women who were harassed or assaulted by Bill Cosby. You can see the amount of women directly in the picture. You can think about stories and contexts and like this front page of the New York Times that shows COVID related death. And you see how it gets darker. Now, if you get closer to so that, each dot is someone dying alive. And the way it makes you feel about a subject, makes you think something about it. Like here when that's uh, in New York were so many that it rips right through the, the title, the, the name of the, the newspaper. And it's right where the city is, like the New York Times in New York is ripped apart by this red uh, line of death. This is so strong. And how can you say this is neutral, right? And unemployment as well in the Wall Street Journal. And another thing is the use of data visualization in itself is a rhetorical device. This is something I use in my master thesis because the main theme of the work was fairy tales for different reasons that I explain in the book. but. Uh, I made examples, I designed examples um, to show um, rhetorical devices in news design and other areas. Here uh, I was like, it's a mock-up newspaper page about an accident that happened in the dwarf's mine, like the fellows of uh, the mates of Snow White, <laughs> uh, roommates, <laughs> uh, there was an accident, but if we use a pie chart showing 364 days of no accidents, only one day of accidents. Then there's a photograph of the mines exec executives talking on the phone, looking smart. And you think, well, one day it's not much. They really doing a good job. I mean, they, it's pretty safe. I mean, these guys are, are good. But if instead of the data visualization, we use a, a photograph, it's the same copy text, the same title, but the photograph is a, a dwarf lying on the ground, bleeding, and his uh, fellow minor uh, friend is desperate, uh, claiming for help, and then you look at the photograph of the mines executives and I think bastards like they are hurting dwarves I mean they should go to jail so it's a choice a rhetorical choice and how to present this information uh, here are real life um, real life examples 
this is when there was a huge earthquake and a tsunami in Japan. And these photographs, they show destruction, um, people affected, property affected, fire, smoke, um, flooding, and you feel something about that. But you can also choose to show it like the Frankfurt Allgemeine. They just show the seismographer register. So you can see that it was a huge earthquake, but you cannot see the destruction, the consequences of the earthquake. So it's something to, to think about the way we choose to present information. And something that people have asked me when I started talking about the lack of neutrality, they, they say, come on, some things are just information. There's nothing rhetorical about it. It's just information. And someone once used this example for me. It's like, pictograms on restroom doors. They just communicate that it's a bathroom and you can get inside if you are with a woman or a man. I'm like, okay. But if you think about it, this communicates something about the place where the bathroom is, the people who run this place. What do you expect when you go inside the restroom? If it's going to be clean, if there's going to be water, if the doors uh, have locks on them. And if you compare this one uh, with this one that's in a bar, you expect different things. And it communicates, it's a restroom, but it's still like, okay, maybe they don't have toilet paper in there and I should look for it somewhere, or maybe it's not gonna be as clean as it should be. And there's always different ways to communicate the same thing. Like this one, you have to understand a little bit of genetics <laughs> to understand, to know which door you're gonna choose. And it says something about the place. And the pictogram itself says something because it communicates that it's a bathroom inside, so it's a restroom, public restroom, that if you're either a man or a woman, you can use it. So it's not separated by gender. It's inclusive because it says anyone can use it, but not really, because you can be someone who does not identify with neither of these two genders. So a few years ago, the company started thinking about it, said, let's be more inclusive. The company where I worked, they sent an email to everyone saying, now we're super inclusive and we're gonna change the pictogram in, in our restroom signs and we're gonna use this one. So uh, transgender people in our company will feel included. And I thought, Really? I mean, do you think they they feel like they're half man, half woman, you know? And we had, it was a university and we had a lot of uh, gender fluid and non-binary and transgender students. And I asked them, asked them, how do you feel about it? And honestly, they were kind of offended, like not kind of offended, they, they felt still even more ex excluded. So we started thinking about it, like, is this how we want people to feel, you know, that they're neither? <laughs> and if we say, if you keep on adding creatures that are allowed in this restroom, is this a solution? Say that, okay, let's put Batman and, I don't know, a mermaid, it's gender neutral. So if, if you think about it, just take the focus out of, who can enter the restroom because if anybody can ask, enter and use the restroom, then this is not an issue. Just communicate uh, what's inside and say, it's a restroom. <laughs> if you go inside, that's what is in there. It doesn't matter who you are, anyone can use it. So the focus should be not trying to include different kinds of people in the pictogram, but just say, it doesn't matter who you are. It's about what's in there, what's inside, what you're gonna do there. So this is also very rhetorical. And when I think about the sign, um, I don't know if in Europe, 
it, it, this is the official one, but here in Brazil is the official one that we need to use in parking spaces, for instance. And if people feel represented by that, it's okay. But what if they don't feel represented? This is a pictogram. It's very few lines, very few elements, but it's still communicating something. And it's rhetorical. It convinces you of how these people are. So when a movement proposed to change the pictogram, and it's easier to realize how rhetorical it is because you can look at someone and think about activity and movement and independence or you can look at a symbol and think of people who are dependent and very not dynamic at all so it's communicating something about someone who's being represented there and we also in, of course i need to think about isotype and that's something very, very, very European. But um, for those who don't, who don't know that, uh, Otto Neurath, Marie Neurath, Gert Arndt, they had this motto of uh, words divide and pictures unite. So if you represent the word with pictures, then everyone would understand. It's a common language. And have all this work of let's explain things to people in Africa with images. And we have to remember that there's rhetoric there because it's communicating something about these uh, issues or people or things represented there. And it's from an European point of view. So when they say these are the five groups of men in the world, like really? Is, uh, do I feel represented there? And is there a gross simplification that, okay, let's, it's okay to simplify because it's easier to understand, but this is very representative. I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe not for everyone. <laughs> and it's something that we, we should think about and question. It's like, who's drawing this? Who's creating this to represent other people? And it's a very European point of view. Uh, another thing that's very rhetorical are maps. And it's something that we're seeing a lot of today because there's a war going on in Europe. And maps are very important when it comes to communicating war topics because geography is crucial. Like the positioning of um, resources and man, it's very important. So maps are also communicating something about people involved in the subject. So it's very it's, it's good to pay attention to the maps being used now because everybody needs to use them now to talk about the war in Ukraine and compare and see how they show each place because maps are very political and they shape our worldview. So when the map says that Middle East is like this, and another point of view will be, no, it's not like this. This is not a country. This is it. This is a country. So it's something very, very rhetorical. Uh, but the thing is, we grow up thinking that the world is like this. This is the world we live in. But if you think about it, the Mercato projection, it stretches everything that's uh, closer to the poles. And those of us on the tropical lines near the equator are squashed together as we were a lot smaller than we actually are. So if we compare, for instance, Greenland and Africa, they seem roughly the same size, but Africa is 15 times larger than Greenland. And if you compare Germany and Ethiopia, also roughly the same size, Ethiopia is close to three times the size of Germany. And does it matter? Yeah, it, it matters because we believe the world is, is like that because we grow up looking at maps uh, that use a Mercado projection. And we think of ourselves a lot smaller than we are. I mean, ourselves who are closer to the equator. This is an interesting way to use it. The 
the size to communicate something. This is a um, from New York Magazine, and they are showing size. They're using size to show places uh, depicted in. I think it's Oscar nominated, yeah, for best picture. And so we can see by the size that New York City is a very, very present in those movies. Uh, Africa is tiny. Latin America is not even there. There's a tiny, tiny Mexico and the rest of it's not even close. So we can use the size as an uh, argument. Here's a classic example. This was in, during, the, uh, during World War II. It was a, a German PR office in the United States publishing German propaganda. So they published this map, a study in empires. Germany, very small, and the British Empire was a quarter of the world. And they asked, can Germany really be the aggressor nation when we're this small? and Britain is so big. So using cartography and size, relative size as an argument. We've seen another example of that recently, the official um, Twitter account for the government of Ukraine. They published this image, realized the scale of Ukrainian heroism, comparing the size of Ukraine and Russia, the largest country in the world. And another thing is, who is in the center? So we grow up uh, thinking that Europe is the center of the world because here in Latin America, list, we use ma maps created by Europeans. But it's a sphere floating around in space. There's no actual center. It's always a choice how we're going to represent it. Uh, an example is this is. Um, an Asian company, Fast Retailing. They are based Fast Retailing. They are based in Japan. So, in their annual reports, they want to show their presence globally. And Asia is in the center. Japan is in the center. So it's not how we usually see the world here. It makes sense for them. I think it's great. And also top bottom, like when we see. Uh, some countries in the top, some countries in the bottom, it leads to a top bottom mentality. So those of us in the Southern hemisphere, we grew up thinking we are on the bottom. Why not use maps like this, you know? And, and this is an equal area projection. So we can really see the size of Latin America and Africa compared to North America and Europe. And this is an important question here in Latin America as we are in a special Latin American season. Um, it's important for us to start to think about what's really our point of view and what it has been taught to us and shown us, shown to us. If it's someone else's point of view that we think it's our own. So it's very exciting, I think, to, to see how much we are thinking about decolonizing. <laughs> thinking about what's really ours and what we inherited from, from colonizing point of views. Talking about maps, you can also think about the purpose of a map. If I wanna uh, walk around Wonderland with Alice, I can use this map and I'm gonna believe it. It looks like Google Maps, it's probably right. I'm gonna get what I need to do, Google. But if I wanna, tell the story, if I want to make someone feel like they're in Wonderland and feel Alice's adventure as they want their own, maybe this map is better. So they're both right and useful, but they have different purposes. If you want a map to attract people, it, you can do it in one way. If you want a map to guide people who work there for maintenance, for instance, you do a different kind of map. So different rhetorical purposes, but they contribute to the, to the view we had, to the image we have of this place. So looking at this map, we think about this place uh, as being fun and nice and colorful. And here's an example of how it is used uh, on the, in the press. This was Time Magazine, so it's a 
US magazine in December 1949. So not long after World War II, they are basically presenting uh, the divided Germany for the American people. So this is the new Germany, like post-war Germany is divided in two. So if you look at the map, the West is, um, they have cows and wine and castles and universities and cathedral. They have the, the men of Hamelin, like with the flute, uh, a lot of things happening and the, the eastern part is Germany, nothing. They are just red. Can we really believe that there's no castles, no universities? I mean, there were a lot of interesting things there, but when they show it like this, they're basically telling American people, there's nothing there. It's a wasteland. That's what we, we want you to think. Um, data visualization, of course, is our main topic here. <laughs> is used for by corporations to communicate success or you know, strategies, uh, their personality. And I think a really nice um, resource for us to understand how companies use data visualization is their annual report. Nowadays, it's not uh, such a big thing, they just submit their 10k form and that's it but a few until a few years ago most companies really invested a lot in annual reports so there was a lot of use of different data visualization resources and we can see how they need to communicate something about that company it's not just about the data it's about the colors it's about the thickness of uh, the lines it's about uh, the pictorial elements. So they're different from company to company. You cannot say just it's data, they just do a chart. It's also part of branding. So that data visualization is part of branding as well. So of course it's not neutral. Here we see um, Adidas. Adidas has this image of being contemporary and active and uh, sporty. So in their annual report, they have to convey the same image. Here an example of um, charts they used in an annual report a few years ago. And you can see the arrow that they use throughout the, the publish, the published annual report is also there. But when you stop to think about it, arrows in those uh, column charts they communicate that the numbers are going up, uh, that these numbers are going to grow, even though they don't have this information. They, they just use the arrow and you think things are gonna get a lot better because the arrow is gonna move in that direction and these bars are gonna get uh, longer. So it's a way to say something that you don't have the data to say, but you imply. So, is also very rhetorical. Here's an um, annual report for uh, Dr. Pepper and Snapples. So they're completely different from Adidas. So they have a, a different branding and you can see how visualization helps uh, to, to convey this message. And here again, we have not an arrow, but we have a running man. So we can also think, okay, all these numbers are gonna get, go, go up everything will be better next year. So arrows is something that we, we need to pay attention because they communicate growth, even though they keep the, the length that it's related to the data. They communicate that the length will get bigger. Another pet peeve of mine is um, 3D pie charts. 3D pie charts, is it make, they make me sick, really. It's something that, just don't do it. This is something that, of course, if you want to compare angles and areas and you distort them, it's, you just cannot do it anymore. They, they don't match the data. Because if you look at, here's how much time each girl danced with the 
with Prince Charming at the ball. We can see that Cinderella spent the most time with him, but to say, okay, it's too simple. Uh, let's make it more interesting. So let's give it some volume. And now the contents looks a lot better because there's a, the whole uh, volume and the whole part of the charts that it does not match the data, but everyone who's the, the front slices, they, they have an advantage. So it's distorting the data. And something I tell my students is like, some things you can choose. What do you want to convey? This is a no-no because uh, 3D pie charts are basically lying. So don't do this. And also, we, I think we need to be suspicious of those who do use it. Because if they are distorting the, the charts, they are hiding the data. And we need to think about why are they doing this? and pay attention to the data. It's like Stephen Jobs, they, he wanted us to, to forget and not notice that Apple is actually uh, the smallest slice there, but let's put it in the front in 3D and explode it so nobody can notice. And I think that applies to a lot of different 3D charts that we need to pay attention if we are distorting the representation of data. And another thing is, of course, uh, columns, if we use it like that, we think there's a big difference between them. But if we pay attention, we're not seeing the full columns because they start at zero, not at 12. If they, we see them starting at zero, we see that difference is not as big as we thought. Also, the problem of uh, using, distorting our traditional view of if numbers go up, the shot goes up. If numbers go down, the shot goes down. He was, uh, this chart is also a famous case, it was published uh, in Florida, and it, it shows how much murders have gone down. But the thing is, they haven't gone down, they are going up, but the chart is upside down. This is the actual, like the traditional way of showing this data would be like this. So it's this very rhetorical. And I said, okay, but we wanted to show blood dropping down. So it's more dramatic. So there's an association with violence. And association is also very important because we can put things together and communicate that they're related, even we don't have even if we don't have the data to as evidence for that. So there's a chart here about freedom. It says nothing about uh, economic, socioeconomical data, but let's put like an impoverished kid in, in Islam and we'll think that freedom is related to poor, poverty. And let's put things together. And right now we live in a in an age that is so huge for data visualization because of COVID, people who have never paid attention to data visualization are now seeing it every single day on TV. We People are learning about uh, weekly averages and you now we're using pie charts, pie charts for vaccinations and everyone heard about flattening the curve. So we had to think about what's the curve and how to flatten it and data changing over time. So it's very important now that we think about how people understand charts, if they do under understand charts. And there's, of course, a lot of history about charts being used to convince people to make decisions on health issues and how using a chart is helpful as an argument. And the thing is, we have to think about how in itself, using a chart is already an argument. Even if the chart doesn't really represent any relevant, relevant data. So in Venezuela, when they said, okay, Nicolas Maduro won the election and we saw this chart on TV and we think, okay, it was a landslide. It was a huge win. Like it's totally validated and it's of course doesn't represent the data if we look at the numbers and it doesn't really make sense this cylinders going up and down 
but it has a rhetorical uh, impact. Here in Brazil, our, our president, and the, after 10 months of government, they say, oh, let's look at these charts and see how much we improved comparing to the previous, uh, uh, our previous presidents, the, the ones, there was one between them for a short time. And if you look at it, the charts are completely unattached to any data. They, they are just drawings. They don't represent any quantity. And it's, it's completely nuts. It's like, what? But people think, oh, he's ch showing charts. So it's true. He's proving his point. So if he says it's better, it's better because he's showing numbers, it's scientific. So this was the right wing doing this and then the left wing, what maybe they could have done. Let's make some really appropriate charts and prove how this is idiotic. But two days after that, the left went on and did the exact same thing. It's like really frustrating. It's like, like let's do the same thing and just make nonsensical chart looking illustrations. And that was maybe the most important one we had recently. That was a, a legal argument that was used in, in court in Brazil. And that was the evidence, the legal evidence they presented that our former president, Lula, was guilty of a list of crimes just by drawing arrows connecting the situations to his name. Of course, we believe it. It's, it's proven, it's evidence. The arrows point to him, so he's guilty. And it was so frustrating as a designer to see that and think people in court use this and it worked. And so how are people prepared to analyze, to critically analyze and consume information design when they believe that this is enough, this is here, yeah, of course, is this is a chart. It's there. So a more recent uh, example, the government wanted to push some medicine to treat COVID and they didn't have the scientific backing to, to say that it was efficient, but they wanted to push it so the, the population should use this. So in the state run um, television, okay, then, okay, they use this chart to say that it was scientifically proved that they, this medicine reduces the viral charge, so it's efficient. So they use a chart that was going down. This was the government showing this on TV. So when people look at it and say, okay, it's proven, there's like a stamp in red saying, look at this chart, Virus, viral charge has gone down. But what is this chart? What's the data? It's completely empty of information. But it was proving that it was scientifically proven that it's efficient. And this chart was actually a um, stock charge that they just bought it and put it there. Uh, it's <laughs> really offensive, but it's official government communication that, uh, that medicine can save your life. So this is highly rhetorical, just using a chart convinces people. And that's not just the government, here's the, the press, because now we are in ele electoral years, we have elections for um, five different uh, elective, uh, we have uh, presidents, uh, the Senate, uh, state government, uh, congressmen. So it's a huge election year in Brazil. And this is kind of chart that we see showing Polls. So it's completely detached from any data. Is this just drawings that look like charts? And they keep on doing it, and people keep on believing it. And this is also pretty recent, from two years ago, two weeks ago. A candidate they he showed two charts. He posted two charts. The first one is an actual chart showing percentage. And the next one, it's not a chart anymore. It's just making his name bigger 
and inside a box. So we think it's a bar and that's way ahead of everybody else. But the other ones are just the same size because it's not a chart. But since he showed a chart before, we believe that this is a chart and he's way ahead of everyone. And now I'm working on, a, um, I'm researching this kind of uh, charts using uh, talking about elections in different ways and um, researching how political parties, their candidates and the press are using charts to to communicate something. And we see these kind of things that they are completely crazy. They have to, uh, huge distortions, but people buy it because they are not prepared to analyze a, a chart and read it critically. And this is in Brazil, but I, I have to hand it down to our to you Portuguese, our friends who also have some geniuses. This political party, if you go through their Twitter, is a, a series of crazy charts because you can see how his has 10% is so close to 26%. And he keeps on doing this, like nine is almost 27 and it keeps on going. It's every single chart this party posts is completely crazy. Yeah, I it's, it's amazing. But they don't even come close. I, I have to say, they are these people at, at Partido Chega, they are doing and they're making an effort to as in the crazy chart department, but they cannot even come close to the winner, the king of crazy charts. It's this one by PSDB. <laughs> Let's just take a look at it. Uh, the, um, the, their candidate, Doria, has 22% on the polls. It's so close to 90 on the um, y-axis. It's 22 is almost 90, come on. And 22 is like 10 times 15%. That's the second, second place. And if you think of, if you look at how many people are indecided, it's 40%. That's like half of 22%. And 10% is smaller than 3% and 4%. It's completely mad. This is the kind of thing we have to deal with in information, in data visualization in politics in Brazil. It's it's work of art. And okay, just to conclude, uh, I've talked a lot already, and talk about interaction when we, use data visualization uh, in digital environments is also very rhetorical. Uh, a very nice example is nine rounds a second by the New York Times when you can you can hear each dot in this uh, chart is a firearm shot. So you can hear like the, the rhythm and you can feel the violence uh, of different guns by how many shots they have a second. Another thing is that we can enter the data and export the data in comparison to our situation. So like here in The Guardian, I could pick a country and see if I know this country well. So I pick Brazil and, and they say out of every 100 prisoners in Brazil, how about how many do you think were born in a foreign country? I thought, okay, maybe seven. And they say, okay, no, it was actually 0.4. And you can see what other people guessed so you can export the data in comparison to what I think. And so I can see in comparison to other people. Here at New York Times, I could move the charts to my situation. So how long do I plan to stay in an apartment, my mortgage details, and I keep on uh, impu uh, inserting my data. So they have a result of if I should rent an apartment or buy an apartment based on my place in that data. Another uh, one, nice one from Nexo here in Brazil that we can uh, type in how much is our monthly salary and we can see in comparison to other people in the country and other people in our state, how do we fare against them? And, and for, of course, to conclude a very nice project here in Brazil, a large team, a very good team. They did this project called Epicenter it's to make people understand the impact of the 
huge amount of lives lost to COVID. And back then it was a lot less than it is now. But people were already like, yeah, it's nobody I know. It's so I don't care. So we could insert our own address and we could visualize if everyone who died of COVID lived around me, how far it would go based on how many people live there. And we think everyone in the circle would die. Everyone around me so far would be dead. So it's a huge impact. So it's data visualization using interactive rhetorical devices to, to communicate and as argument. So in my PhD, I research how uh, interaction design can be rhetoric. So if you're interested, but this is one is all in Portuguese, at least for now. <laughs> but there's always this book, um, uh, Rhetorica na Interação. It's about rhetoric in interaction. So just a final thought that I want to leave you uh, with. Before I did this PhD in a design school about rhetoric in interaction design, I wanted to research about science. So I tried to do a PhD in biochemistry. <laughs> And it sounds crazy, but what I wanted to do it was research data visualization in scientific papers, how much they influence uh, the citations and the overall impact of the paper. If how they, the, if the charts are they influence, they if they are rhetorical enough to influence that. And it was funny because I presented my case, my project, to a panel of scientists. Half of them said, oh, this is amazing. We should really look into it. This is great. And the other half said, this makes no sense because we have, if we have this data, it's going to be this chart. There's only one way to do a chart if we have this data set. We don't choose anything. It's just we put the data and the chart comes out. I said they don't even realize that someone is choosing how the chart's gonna be. So maybe it's the software and they don't think about it, but someone, something's making the decisions. So I just wanna leave with the thought that there's still a lot to do. That people, we, are, we don't grow up learning in school how to read charts, how to understand information design as something that people chose to do it that way, it does, just doesn't happen that way. So as designers and people who, that work, who work with uh, data and information design, it's very important to us, for us to talk about it, bring it to the public, uh, bring up conversations like the ones, the one we're having here, the ones that Data Visage Board is bringing to the public and talk to our kids, to our schools and bring the word of data visualization as something that people should know as citizens. It's something that impacts our, the way we choose, our people who lead us, the way we understand data presented to us. So it's our job to, to help in that department and to, to bring light to the subject. So I want to invite you to keep in touch with me in Instagram, or I'm also on YouTube with Visualizando. And I thank you very much. I'm sorry, I totally overstand my time. So I, I hope there's still someone with us now. And thank you very much, Data Viz, Liz, people. It has been a pleasure. Obrigada. Obrigada, Baba. Thank you so much for being here. It was very interesting. And now people can can ask questions. Uh, let's start with Salome because Salome has a very good question. Uh, yeah, I it came to me during the your talk just in, in the beginning. Um, and when you were talking about being in, in Germany and the modernist movement, and I wanted to question to ask you if you think that the strive for neutrality, this belief that um, visualization should be neutral is culturally dependent, like if it changes from country to country. Yes, definitely. I I worked on a research a few years ago with Ricardo Arthur Carvalho, and we research about the intention of neutrality in modernism. 
And it's very interesting to study their discourse, like the text they written, not only the, the artifacts they designed, but how, how they talked about it, how, what they wrote about it, and how we can perceive how it's connected to context, to geographical and to the time times they were uh, living. It's, we can see the connections when you look from afar, of course. It's harder for us to, to in that, identify that in our own culture, because culture for us, it's always natural. It seems something that it's, it's given, it's just there. But when we look at another culture that we're detached from, from time or locally, we can really see what's cultural there, what's connected to the time and to the place people are living in. And when you look at modernism, I think it's pretty clear now when we are um, detached enough from it to see what is connected to the to the times and what they're basically what they wanted to move away from. Like this, it was something they needed to not be what it was before them. And I think we're gonna see that about us in the next generation. Probably we'll see that about us as well. How we we are like as we are because we want to be different from things that were happening before. Makes makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Mata, go ahead. Yeah, so let's start with a, a question from the audience. Actually, it's from Sara, our part of our team here in Database Lisboa. Sara asked, uh, are there groups that are especially prone to use these data visual visualization tricks? Uh, like right wing or left wing, for example, or can everyone be equal tempted to use them? What do you think? Yeah, it's just interesting that um, yesterday I was part of a, a master thesis. Um, I don't know how to use it in English, but I was one of the, I was evaluating a work. So the uh, master student was presenting the work and I had to uh, critic him. And it was about, he was comparing left and right here in Brazil, how they use rhetorical devices, not especially about data visualization, it was more about uh, YouTube videos, but it was interesting to see that we, everyone uses this kind of tricks. And uh, I show like they were using the exact same trick two days before, after another. And, but the thing is the audiences, they, at least not here, they respond to different um, rhetorical devices. So uh, if we, we talk about videos, for instance, the left wing audience expects something from the videos so they can believe it and identify themselves with the videos. And the right wing people expect different things. But when it comes to data visualization, uh, it's pretty much the same tricks used throughout the field. I've been researching now uh, the candidates in Brazil, and so far it's been, I, I can't spot this, this kind of devices uh, throughout the field. It's the same, because I think even, even if people are more knowledgeable, like uh, campaign managers and advertising people and marketing people, they are very, very skilled in the streets for uh, audiovisual and posters and WhatsApp messages. They know everything they they should do. But data visualization is still kind of a mystery. So they still use it very loosely in a way. There's not a lot of knowledge there. So there are even people who, who I honestly think they make mistakes because they, they don't know how to make it better. They just they don't know how to do something right, but there are a lot of tricks that people just think it's okay. It doesn't matter. It's there's not a problem. It, it's an illustration. It's not if you want to do, we can do anything because the way we use photographs, we use data visualization. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in this field and throughout the political spectrum, it's the same. People, everybody do this kind of thing. It's amazing. Uh, there is a question quite in, in the same realm, so I'm going to post it. Um, 
Luis asks if this kind of attitude towards manipulating this visualization by political parties, do you think it comes from intention, like intention to be deceitful, or sometimes it can be come mm -hmm. out of ignorance? Both. I really do believe in that's both. Also, by knowing people who work in the field, it's both. Sometimes it is intentional and it's uh, well crafted and it's something that it, they had a lot of work to make it to that crazy chart. And sometimes it's, it's just that we're not prepared because I think in advertisement, if we in, in our schools of advertising, we don't learn anything about data visualization. But even worse than that, in design schools, most design schools still do not teach anything about data visualization. And I personally believe that data visualization and visual rhetoric should be taught in schools, like in basic education. When we are little kids, we should start learning about charts so that everyone can read them and understand them and understand financial information and health information and political information. But I think it's in a level that nobody learns anything about it, except a very tiny, small group of people who really love the subject. So sometimes it's not their fault, like they're advertising people who do this crazy charts because they were not prepared for it. Sometimes it's deceitful for, with, with intention, of course, but sometimes it's just that they're not prepared for it. They don't know how to do it. They don't know that, that it matters most of all. Yes, I totally agree with you. <laughs> so let's see another one from Georgie. Uh, does it make sense to include people with data viz expertise into multi multidisciplinary teams that are fighting disinformation online? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I teach in a communication school. I teach future journalists and advertising people. And we have, a, of course, a lot of people in the journalism field studying disinformation and fighting it. And they also not, they're not prepared to deal with information design to data, data visualization is kind of a mystery still to them. So we need people with data viz expertise in these teams and we need more presence, not just the, the people who they will call when they have, they want to know something about one chart, but also we can propose actions and we invite other people into our multidisciplinary teams. And we should have also this, um, we take the steps to be there with them not just wait for them to realize that it matters to talk about uh, data viz. So that's, I think one of my goals to study these charts is to be there with them talking about it and show how it matters. And yeah, I think we're still lacking it. Like designers are, are usually like, ah, I don't wanna mess with that. You know, <laughs> it's complicated. People will hate me. So, so we need to take more action. I, Totally agree with that. Great. Um, I had just one more uh, question um, about truth, uh, because there is this sense that neutrality equals more truthfulness, um, and it, because it shows, it can shows different sides. But do you, do you believe this true? How how for you? How does neutrality correlate with truth? Yeah, I think the important thing for truth is accuracy. It, it needs to be accurate. Data visualizations should represent data. I think the line charts we see is when the charts distort the data. They stop representing the data, being faithful to the data. So accuracy is very important, as it is in anything. Like in journalism, you also have to talk about something being accurate. So precision is very important, but neutrality is impossible. It's impossible. It's like if you're a journalist and you're reporting an event, every word you choose, you are making decisions that are rhetorical. You're taking a stand. The same thing with data visualization. 
you if you choose the the type of data you're going to use you are being rhetorical you're not neutral anymore if you choose to use a chart instead of just writing the numbers on a table for instance you're making a rhetorical choice you're going to highlight data instead of hiding it so neutrality is impossible if, if you strive for neutrality you're already creating a problem for yourself because you're not stopping to think about what do I want to communicate and how I'm going to do it and so I can do it more efficiently. If you pretend to be neutral, you're going to communicate something that you're not preparing and you're not really thinking about it and it's not going to be as good. But accuracy is what makes it makes something true, truthful. Is You have to respect the data and select the data so if you the data you select in a data set is already a choice but you have to do it ethically thinking how accurate will i be if i make this selection instead of another so i would think more in the grounds of accuracy and precision than neutrality neutrality just give up on it it doesn't happen okay i agree <laughs> Speaking about that, <laughs> I want to know your opinion about uh, this chart junk idea <laughs> from a rhetorical oh. perspective, maybe. Yeah, we should uh, call <laughs> Ricardo Cunha Lima, our friend, who is very passionate about it. Because when you think about chart junk and Edward Tuft, we think about Nigel Holmes and the USA Today charts, and there's this whole debate. I remember being in many uh, bars, uh, having drinks and discussing this. This is so nerdy to say that, but it has been happen happening a lot. And honestly, I think they're both um, rhetorical. If you think I'm going to use a uh, few as little elements as I can, because I'm going to communicate better if there's nothing there that is superfluous. Or, this is a rhetorical uh, decision. It's a device. He may think people will believe me more if I don't have a flower coming out of the chart. People will think I'm more serious. This is a rhetorical decision. The same way that if Nigel Holmes makes um, a waterfall with the chart, people will remember the chart more. People will be interested in the chart. People will want to read it. People will understand what it what the graph is about, the chart is about. So they're both rhetorical resources. There's, I don't think that like one is right, one is wrong. I just think that Edward Tuft, when we read it, at least when I read it, when I was in first year of college, it was so uh, so dogmatic. It's like, this is the way to do it. And you maybe we grew up believing that if we don't do it like Edward Tuft, we, we're totally wrong and people are going to burn us in effigy. But they're all rhetorical strategies and they're both valid. And I truly believe that there are times to use it, the, like the, to do the Tufty way. There are times to use the Nigel Holmes way. It's, they're both valid if we look at them critically, if we think about it, just not not just repeat it, you know. But I, on this war, I'm on the side of taking a, a bit of both. Okay. Um, this is too interesting of a conversation. Uh, we'll let a little over time, but it's worth it. Sorry. Have one last question. No, we have one last question, and I have to put it because, because you mentioned him. Uh, Ricardo him. asks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He asks, don't you think that database field is too focused on best practices and not enough on rhetorics? Yes, definitely. So uh, whenever I talk about um, best practices or in talks or my students or my videos, I always include rhetorical practices because I think one practice we don't have enough is think about it. <laughs> it's when we are designing our data visualizations, think about communication because when you think about information design, the main function is communication. So when you think about form follows function, we're thinking about numbers and readability and technical things. 
but sometimes you forget that the main function is to communicate. If we don't communicate, it's pointless. If we make a chart that nobody understands or nobody cares, it's pointless. And uh, something that we discuss a lot, like Ricardo and I, that how it, data visualization is getting technical, it's getting too technical. So it's a, in a point where ergonomics is huge. We think about ergonomics and data visualization, but we forget about people, that it's communication to people and people will understand something in a way, in a context and in a different way in another context. And we have feelings and emotions and we make mistakes. And so when we detach design too much from communication, I think we're detaching it from, from people. We're just thinking about how to make things, how the numbers work, how the programming works. But we, we need to think about communication and communication is, is rhetorical, is rhetoric, is how we, we connect people through discourse, either verbal or visual or interactive. So I totally agree with Ricardo that uh, best practice should involve communication and rhetoric, for sure. So thank you so much. I think it's a good end. Uh, do you want to add something else, Salome? Uh, no. <laughs> I think we're we've we've closed we we've surpassed one hour. Thank you so much, Barbara, for being here. It was fascinating. A little scary, <laughs> yes, fascinating. No, I wanna end up on hope that we we are the ones who who should work on it to make it better and be more responsible. But actually, I think to end a good note, uh, Working with communication and data visualization can be a real pleasure. And when I start about thinking how we communicate with data, it can be a lot of fun. So don't give up. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, Barbara. So now let's talk about our newsletter, Pastel de Data. It is where you can read about Portug Portugal's data viz practitioners and get insights on what's coming next and check recommendation. In this special Latin American special season, we, the recommendations will be from Latin American people. So wait for it. And we are very happy to announce, I'm particularly happy to announce that our next guest will be Veridic. He's a lecturer in multimedia journalism at the New Newcastle University and the author of The History of the Infographic. Uh, his main concerns are sociology, the history of news and online and data journalism. So stay, stay tuned. He's not a part of the Latin America special, <laughs> of course, but we'll have future guests on it for sure. And to finish, we have two events recommendations. Uh, first, a uh, meetup from our neighbors from Data Viz Zurich on Thursday. And the other one is uh, new, the new edition of 2CO Communication Complexity, is a design conference exploring ways to make information more accessible through design. And, that, and that's it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking questions. And we'll see you on July 21st. Bye, guys. See you. Thank you very much. Beijinhos.